All right, it's 10 o'clock, time to get started. We're glad you're here this morning. We're uh, finishing up our study of Hebrews, and we'll be going through chapters 12 and 13 today. So hang on to your seats, here we go. We're going to be concentrating mainly on the, on the questions as we go through to be able to do this. Uh, normally we would include the readings, but these are some of the long, longer readings, and I tested it out, and it would take 10 to 15 minutes to go through that, so we don't have time for that today. So I know you guys have all read uh, through the text on that, and we'll be getting into some of the text as we go through. <clears throat> all right, so here we are. We've had the, uh, we've looked at the, the, all of, of the, the book. It's split into two parts. We looked at uh, Christ is the Way. Uh, which uh, took up a large portion, which which led us into the understanding of uh, this would be a good idea to uh, to follow and do these things because after all, it's such a better way of doing things God's way than it is our own. And so we get into the second part there uh, from chapters ten through thirteen. Um, we're now here uh, down in the end uh, as we are looking at the the fifth warning. Uh, which is the idea of having the same faith as those we talked about in chapter 11. And as we get into chapter 12, now we're seeing some practical applications uh, of that. And it deals with the idea of endurance, endurance of faith uh, in chapter 12. And then, and then some, some examples of how to perform in that faith in chapter 13. And so... Uh, here we are, chapter 12. We're going to be covering these, uh, these particular areas as we, uh, as we go through, and the author was good at putting these uh, breakouts together. So like I said, we're going to skip past the text right now. We're going to go right to the questions. And so the first question is a, a tie-in question. Uh, how does this chapter relate to the previous chapter? So we know what was happening in uh, chapter 11. Do you remember? Okay, the Hall of Faith, yes, a uh, good way of looking at it. Uh, lots of examples, right, for us to be able to uh, win in times of trouble and endurance and need of patience and all those things. We can look back at that and say, hey, look, it's been done before many, many times. And, of course, who, who is the top at the top of that list if you had an example or an, a, a, a person that you were, would follow as a guide? Ha, ah, gotcha. Like, that was the trick question part of it. Yes, in Hebrews uh, chapter 11, we found a, the beginning of Abraham and a bunch of other folks who followed another example. You say, well, wait a second, they didn't follow Jesus, right? I mean, we're talking about Jesus, right? So those Old Testament folks that were being faithful, they weren't following Jesus. Jesus came way later, right? No, that's right. All of the word, all of God's, when the God of the Old Testament includes Jesus associated with that. So that when they were obeying through faith and everything, they were obeying the word of God. And when you obey the word of God, you're obeying Jesus, okay, as it goes through. So, uh, don't, yeah, don't, that was a trick question. Thank you, Gil, for helping me out with that one. Okay, so we have the idea of the example. So how does that tie in then to chapter 12? Chapter 11 did. Yeah. Listed all those. So we got the example part. So it says there's such a great cloud of witnesses, which is referencing to all those in chapter 11. Okay, so yes. So because we have this great cloud of witnesses, all these people that have gone successfully before us, all right, as a result of that, therefore, right, starts with therefore, therefore what? What's going to happen in chapter 12? Okay, yes, yes, <laughs> endure, we can do it too, it's part of, it's part of what, yeah, uh, so the question in chapter 12 then that we're going to have is, what does it take to be successful? What do we need to do to be successful? If you come back tonight, a uh, little, little teaser, we're going to be dealing with Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And uh, so 
as we get through that. And we're going to talk about it a little bit this morning, uh, too, as we go through that. So question two, what is the cloud of witnesses that is being talked about in verse one? Okay, the faithful, who, who, those who lived by faith in the past, all right? All right, so question three, what, is it, what does it mean that Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith? Let's take with the, the author part first. What is an author? A <laughs> person who writes a book. And if he's not plagiarizing... <laughs> What, is, what does it tell you about that book's materials? Okay, I heard twice. Go ahead, Clarissa. Yeah, it's his, right? He, so, yeah, he's, he's the one. So the, the founder, the, the originator of the idea of the book in, the, in this particular case is the, is the founder, is the author. And so in, in Jesus' case, he was the first one to finish the race of faith, when you think about it. Uh, think about the things that he did. He went all the way through, as a man, all the way through life, died, was raised again, and now is sitting at the right hand of God in position of all authority. His Father has given him all authority. And so, now, if you wanted to look at the things that we could do in life, where would be the beginning? When we're born, okay. And then spiritually, when we're born again, <laughs> right? And we become a Christian, we get adopted in there. And where does all that end up? Oh. Okay, well, there's a little stop called death first, right? And <laughs> Or Jesus coming again. But... You're right, the end is not the end of this life. The end of it is the same place where Jesus ended up, is being with Jesus, is being, is being in heaven at the end. So that's, Jesus has shown us how to make that entire journey. He's the first one. So that's why he's the author of our faith, all right? He's the first one to receive the promise, okay? Now, how many of you have ever heard of Roger Bannister? Ah, I got one of the old guys back here. <laughs> You and me, right? Yeah, Roger Bannister was uh, an Englishman who, uh, back in 1954, ran the four-minute mile. He was the first one to run a mile in less than four minutes. Now, up until that time, I was born in 1952, so uh, this is in my... I don't remember Roger Bannister, but, <laughs> um, but I remember the stories about him. And the four-minute mile was thought, at one time, it was thought to be the, the ultimate uh, stre uh, stress test on a human body. Many people, many experts believed that it was impossible to run in less than four minutes because it had never been done before. As a matter of fact, you would die. Your body would die before you were able to run a mile in less than four minutes. And Roger Bannister did it. And then within a week, two other people did it. And there are over a thousand men who have run miles of under four minutes today. As a matter of fact, if you want to be a top competitor in the mile, you've got to be able to run a mile in less than four minutes. And so now what happened? What happened between the you're going to die and a thousand people running or more running in less than four minutes. What changed? Ah, yes. Was it, a, was it because the bodies got so much stronger? No, it was up here, wasn't it? Yeah, that was the difference. That was the change. And so this idea of a promise, the idea of being the first one to successfully run, somebody had to do it first. Jesus did. In, in uh, the 11th chapter, we found a list of a whole bunch of other people that did it too, because it's, it's now possible. We know we can do it. So author of our faith, how about the finisher, the perfecter? What is it? We, we, the term perfect is used in many different ways, right? And normally we think of it as a, whoo, perfect, man, you're just perfect. But 
In, in biblical terms, uh, many times it's used in a, in a different way. And how is that, Francis? <laughs> complete, to be complete, right. So he's not only the author of our faith, but he's also the perfecter of our faith, the completer of our faith. And so when you think about it, he completed all the Father's requirements. He set the example for us to follow it's for when we go through endurance and trials, there's nobody that's going to go through more than what Jesus went through. He kept his sight on the reward, despising the shame. He, he made a decision that I'm going to obey the Father because the reward from the Father is so much greater than the punishment and everything that I'm going to receive back here. And we have the same, we have to make the same decisions in life that Jesus made. Same ones. And it's just as tough for you and me as it, is, as it was for him. I mean, it's a, think about your own problems. Does anybody have bigger problems than you do? <laughs> right? I mean, sometimes if you've got a problem, it's all you can handle sometimes, right? And that's because problems are very individual. They are. And your individual problem is no bigger, no less than anybody else's. And Jesus had the same issues, but he was able to do it. He showed us the way. So it's, it's a cool thing that he did. So que question four, in what way could the persecution that's mentioned in verse three of chapter 12, said, for consider him who has endured such hostility or persecution by sinners against himself. How could that be considered light? What is it that he, the Hebrew writer is, uh, uh, says about this, that it is, and the hint is verse 4. Why, why is this considered light affliction that they've been going through? Shirley? Anything compared to what Jesus went through. <laughs> yes. But what, what was the... What's the difference between what Jesus went through and what we're going through right now? Yeah, he's, he's, he died. Yeah, they, they, they literally shed blood. So these folks hadn't, hadn't been to that point yet. That's the, that's the issue. But the thing is, is that the writer of Hebrews knew that they were going to face that eventually. And so it's one of those things of, I'm giving you this so that you can do this. It's coming. Just be ready for it. All right, question five. What is the chastening of the Lord? Verses five through 11 talks about chastening of the Lord. What is chastening? A rebuking. A rebuking. Okay. All right. So we talked, uh, Jesse is part of the, his sermon series and everything has been talking about uh, chastening, rebuking, those, those kinds of things. And those are, and, and uh, as a matter of fact, Jason in the, uh, in the class on uh, Wednesday night just recently has been, we've been talking a lot about <laughs> this particular thing. And another word for chastening or rebuking and would be what? Discipline. Discipline. Okay, very good. So, uh, it, in verses 5 through 11, there's a picture here that's being drawn. What's the picture that's being drawn between two individuals? The person that's in authority and the person that is subject to that authority. Who's the person in authority that's being talked about up here? I heard it. The father, okay, right? And son, child is, is on the other side of that, okay? So we have to hear the picture of a, of, a, of a loving father and how a loving father would treat the child that he loves. And it's applying this idea of discipline. Discipline is, is going to be that which is applied. And in this particular case, the chastening of the Lord, now we're talking about God's discipline on his children. Okay, and that's, and that's where this idea is going to. So what is the point that's being made about the chastening of the Lord? So let's look at some of the principles that are associated with this in 5 through 11. 
What's, what's the, the first principle we talked about, I'll get you started, is this idea of fatherly discipline, okay? Something that's stern, something that's just, it's the right thing to do, it's consistent, all those things, and they're all done out of love. It's not for the father that it's being done, it's for the child that it's being done, okay? So what else is, is talked about in there? What does that do? In the, to build the relationship between the father and the child. What are some of the aspects associated with that? Good will come from it. Okay. And name some goods that would come from that. Well, we obey, then we will. Okay. okay. There's benefits and obedience. Clarissa? Respect. Respect. Yeah, uh, exactly. We've got one of the, the ideas of respect coming in there. What else? What is it about proper discipline that, that, that makes it so that it's powerful when it's given? If it's done right, okay, it's done in love. Is this something that... Uh, eh, you, I'm gonna, you know, for the next year, you're grounded, <laughs> you know, for, for whatever. Normally, the, the, those, those things kind of wear off after a while, like, like Jason, Jason was saying. So sometimes you get, you're so bad as a kid and you get beat so much that, you know, it's just like, of course, you know, t- give me another one, you know, kind of thing. But effect, okay, if, if teaching and Effective discipline is applied at the time of the infraction so that it, you know, it's clear in your mind and it's done for a short period of time. It may be painful for a short period of time, but it, it, it's, it's like, bam, there you are. That's the discipline right there. Boom, and then we're, now we're moving on. I love you, okay? But we're moving on to something else. So again, it's painful, but it's short. It's compared, compared to the consequences of the mistake, left undisciplined, okay? And, that, and that's, that's the, the key that is being talked about here and uh, the relationship that is built. Uh, how about this? God is our Father, and we are thankful for His discipline. It shows that He loves us and our children. So you put all these ideas together. It's the, it's, it's the idea, picture in, in chapter 12 of this beautiful relationship of love being expressed in whatever manner is necessary for the best of the child. And it's because the father loves the child that he's paying close attention to what the child's doing. He cares about what the child's doing. He applies reproving, rebuking, wherever is necessary to get him back on course to wherever it is. It shows attention. It shows caring, all those things. It, it, it doesn't show this, which is the lack of discipline part. This is not from God, the ignoring of the, of the mistake. Well, that's going to be rough. To, you know, he probably didn't mean to do it anyway, you know, so I just, just ignore it. And the, and the kids just going, going merrily along. Uh, <laughs> Down, down, floating down the river of life. Okay, so a fa- the, the Bible's saying the father who does not discipline does not love his child. And to the point of what, what is the example that is given in here of the father who does not discipline his child, that child is like what? Like an illegitimate child. Like it's not even his and at the time that that was written, not so much today, the stigma is gone a lot today, but at the time this was written, that was a big deal, big, big deal for you to be an illegitimate child. And, and so that's what, no discipline means no concern about who the child is, what the child is becoming, what the child's going to become. And so it's a it's a sad situation. Okay, question seven. Yeah, go ahead, Todd. It's important not to 
miss the context because this isn't the kind of discipline in, in the context where they've done something wrong and are being punished for it. He's talking about the endurance that's needed when you are doing something right and they're trying to give up doing what's right in order to not feel the pain, right? Yeah, good point. He's, he's definitely done the punishment stuff, Old Testament, you're doing what's wrong, I'm sending you a famine, I'm doing these things to punish you. Mm -hmm. But here it's, it's that training. So uh, it's like sending your son out into the yard to do some hard labor. And yeah, it's gonna hurt, you're gonna be sore at the end of the day, but it's gonna train you to be able to do more work and be more productive. So it's mm -hmm. that kind of pain that he's inflicting from them doing what's right. Yeah, because remember the example is from uh, in chapter 11, which is this, the one that this is the, the build on, is the successful people, the successful people of faith who were, who were moving along and making the right decisions about those kinds of things. Francis? Verse 11, it says, Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Right. Trained to do the right thing. Uh, so whether, whether or not the, the example is a bad one, you were bad and the parent is watching you and corrects you, or the bully down the street beats you up, for doing the right thing. And you, I mean, there's not, there's not a correction involved by the father in that particular case, but he's still paying attention as to what happened as it goes on. And, and so the, the, the principle can be applied in whatever the situation is. The bottom line on it is, father cares you, about you so much, he's paying attention to you. He's watching what you're doing. He's directing you actively. And whatever that takes, and that's the training. It's not the, uh, the one-sided discipline where it's all punishment. Discipline means punishment. No, discipline means training, whatever that takes to get you into that situation. And so this is the, uh, again, we're in the exhortation side of this, right? Of the, of the letter. It, what do you need to do? So this is a, this is a lesson for fathers, to pay attention, and those that are children of God who are receiving the discipline. And we need, to, we need to be reminded occasionally as the receivers that, ouch, yeah, okay, yeah, that, uh, re-examine. I'm going to re-examine my butt, and then I'm, <laughs> I'm going to re-examine uh, what I did to, to deserve this from Dad because this, this was painful, and so a little re-examining is helpful at the, in that case. So question seven, what does, what does following peace have to do with things in the context of verse 14? In verse 14, it's talking about uh, seeking peace or pursuing peace with all men, okay? So what, what, is the, what does this have to do with anything here? What is... What's the purpose of pursuing peace in our, in our interactions with other people? Brothers and sisters in Christ, people of the world, people that hate you, people that love you. Well, what good does it do? It's not a peaceful world. Certainly, I've been beat a, beat a few, few good times. Sam? So it says, uh, well, when it starts this point in verse 12, it says, therefore, so you know it's, mm, right. it's regarding what it said before it. And in verse 10, it says that we may share his holiness. Mm -hmm. And the continuation is that by being at peace, we are emulating Christ. Okay, okay. Uh, Ken? Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. Peace, peace seems to be a pretty important thing. Uh, uh, Francis, go ahead. Verse 14, it says, without which no one will see the Lord. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> let's, pursue, let's pursue that <laughs> for a second. Uh, so when you think about peace, but what God's asking is, 
This, this is supposed to be what our reaction to persecution is. When, when Jesus says, he slaps you on the cheek, give him the other cheek. That is not a violent maneuver, that is a peaceful maneuver. Go walk the, another mile with the guy that takes your cloak, and off you, off you go. I mean, these, are, these are reactions to persecution. Okay, so the first, our reaction to persecution, Jesus' reaction to persecution was to pursue peace. To pursue peace. And so that's a surprise to the world. That's a shocker. Okay, you want to get somebody's attention, right? At work, at school, where, whatever it is you're happening to do, and somebody comes up and just, you know, nails you verbally physically, whatever, and your reaction is not to give them back twice what he gave you, and that's different. That's a different thing. So, so pursuing peace is, is really, it's, it should be our initial goal in all personal interactions that we have with everybody. Our goal in going into a, a reaction is, especially that, that guy that just said, said it, a nasty email, you know, a word about me, and man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let him have it, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going, no, that's not, that's what the world would do. The initial reaction should be to pursue peace. Now, we know that that's not always possible. Who wants to read Romans 12, verses 17 through 21? Whoever gets there first to read that. Romans chapter 12. Verses 17 through 21. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Okay, so, so here we have the, the idea of doing that, of pursuing peace with, with all people. In that, doing that, you will stand out. People are going to wonder, who is this person that would react in that way? Uh, the, and, the, and the normal things are going to happen to you. you. You could be mocked. You know, you can almost set up the columns, you know. There's going to be the mockers, the scoffers, you know, the people, I don't know what, what's going on, right? Then you're, going, then you're going to have some people that go, man, what a guy <laughs> that is to, to react like that. Why did you do that? And all of a sudden you have the opportunity to teach God's word to them, so and it's a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful way of uh, it's a mindset that you're not cocked into the position of get even, but you're pursuing peace. Francis, um, I don't understand how you can be the way that you are, how people can do what they do to you when you turn around like it never happened. <laughs> These persons. Are, um, <coughs> I, you know, something to that reference. And I said, well, you can do the same thing. Well, you know, they couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> that was not their thing. But they, yeah. they obviously saw that. And they thought, I wish I could be like you, but I can't. I said, yes, you can. Yes, you can. <laughs> a beautiful example of, of, yeah, exactly, having the opportunity to do that. Let's take a look at verse 12, uh, 14. And look at, the, look at the word in the New American Standard uses the word uh, sanctification. Um, the, the King James uses the word holiness. What, what is, uh, let's look at the, the definition of sanctification here. Uh, this is from uh, Baker's Dictionary. The, uh, the generic meaning of sanctification is the state of proper functioning. To sanctify someone or something is to set that person or thing apart for the use of intended by its designer. In other words, a pen is sanctified 
when it's used to write something, not to poke somebody in the eye with. Okay? And so th- this idea would pursue peace with all men and the sanctification, this is what Francis was talking about earlier, the sanctification, this, this setting aside to be used for the purpose for which the designer designed you. It says, without which no one will see the Lord. So when we seek peace with all men, then we are being as the creator designed us to be. That's the way he designed us. And so only then can we then see the Lord. When we say see the Lord, what are we talking about? Francis? Our eternity, you see, yes, that would be part of that picture. But it, it, uh, when, when we talk about being able to see somebody, to see the Lord, to, what are we, what are we talking, what's involved with that? I see you, yeah, I see you. Manner of life, you're, 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 you're looking at them and you are trying to understand them. We, it, it's, about, it's about gaining knowledge about them. It's about understanding. It's about uh, who, who are they when you see them. A close look, we're going to look a little later about looking closely or paying attention to something. And it's, it's trying to understand what it is that you're seeing. And so if we want to see the Lord, if we want to understand God, understand his word, and all of that for us, then we've, we've got to then do things, be sanctified. Our life should be spent doing things as, design, as we were designed for by the creator. And pursuing peace is one of those things. It's a very important first step. Okay, question eight. What is meant by looking carefully? (laughs) I gave you a little hint on this one. Anyway, in in verse 14, the the idea uh, is in the King James Version, uh, looking carefully is used. New New American Standard says, see to it. Okay, so the idea is to pay attention. Just just pay attention to what is going on, what you're doing. Uh, Pay attention to who you're listening to, et cetera. In other words, God's done everything for us already. Plan of salvation is in effect. Jesus is on the throne. The only thing keeping you from heaven is you. Think about that. That's it. The only thing keeping you and me from going to heaven is us. And, and so, don't, don't miss out. Don't, don't make the wrong choice in that. Everything's been done for you already. Consider the phrase that no root of bitterness uh, springing up, causing trouble. Uh, any of you have um, a problem with digging up something that you didn't want in your yard in the way of a plant or something, and then, sure enough, next spring... In the same place where I know I got all of it, here they come, right back up again. Well, that's that's called a a little root, piece of that root that's still, you missed, it's still there. That thing, it just grows again. I got some great plants around my my house that are doing exactly this. And Phyllis keeps saying, well, you get rid of that thing. I tried, honey, I tried. (laughs) And you just can't get rid of it. But... What does inattention to our spiritual health lead to? Just like those weeds in the yard or whatever it is you're trying to get rid of. What does it lead to if you just don't pay attention? Okay. Lack, lack of attention leads to kind of a apathy, which leads to... When you're not doing something, you're getting weaker, Right? And if you're doing something, you're getting stronger as you're doing it. So, yeah. Uh, don't forget about the roots. That's, that's one of the things I wanted to get to you there. Okay, what is the contrast in verses 18 through 24? Um, there's, there's some specific contrasts. I'll give you the first one. <clears throat> the, uh, 
what we're talking about is the difference in the experiences of coming before God in the Old and New Testaments. What was it like to come before God in the Old Testament? We're talking about at Mount Sinai. What was happening there? when the people came before the mountain to, to talk with God. <laughs> Terrifying, yeah. Smoke, fire, uh, thunder. Uh, the, the Lord's uh, voice was in the thunder. Ah, you know, it's coming out and they're saying, please don't, you know, Moses, go, go talk to him up there. Yeah, a lot of, lot of stuff was happening. This is the way uh, it was designed in the Old, in the old Testament. Uh, the idea of, of fear was a big was a big deal. We talked about earlier uh, the the difference between uh, God's approach to teaching His people in the Old Testament, a younger, more immature spiritually group of human beings, okay, the Israelites, and the patriarchal folks over, over there. Don't forget about them too. All the Gentiles, <laughs> they were out there too. And the New Testament, um, expected to be a more mature spiritually group of people who now just, you know, you just have one thing to do, change, change. So the, the, new, the new covenant, you have the heavenly focus, the, the throne, the city, all of those, those things, uh, the name's already being registered in heaven. Uh, the hope of heaven, all of that is in there. Uh, the spirits that uh, were made perfect through the blood of Christ. Uh, we have a mediator that's up there. Look at the, look at the, look at the difference. Never forget, with the first whole first half of, of the book of Hebrews was about these differences. Okay, but the writer's bringing it back up again, right here as a point of exhortation for you and me to remember these. This contrast is, is a stark contrast. We have it so much better now. Uh, question 10. What has been shaken and what will not be shaken? What was shaken? In verses 25 through 29. Earth, Earth okay. So physical world, what else? <laughs> There's only one other thing. Physical world. And, and heaven and the spiritual world. That's right. You, you remember where he talks about the, uh, the idea that uh, there was a grand mystery? A lot of different mysteries that came out. But one of the mysteries was there was a mystery for the folks in heaven, too. About They didn't know. The angels and the seraphim and everybody that was up in heaven, they weren't in on all of what was happening. I mean, Jesus himself does not even know when it's going to be time for him to come back. Think about that. And he's sitting on the throne right now. It's his father who has the answer to that question. So, it, uh, yeah, the world, heaven's foundations, all were part of that. The part that was not shaken was God's kingdom, the church. Okay? And that will never be shaken. All right? So that's, that's part of all of that. All right, so there was uh, lesson 12. We're going into lesson 13 now. And I knew this was going to be tough. Okay, let's see. Mm, yeah. In context, verse, uh, of verse 1 in chapter 13, it says, Let love of the brethren continue. What are some ways that brotherly love can be shown in accordance with the, the uh, beginning there of chapter 13? What are some things you can do? How can, how can brotherly love be shown? Hospitality is a big one, yeah. Went through some of that uh, yesterday, experienced some of that. Good way to initiate friendships. What else? Entertaining strangers, yes. So that, that would be a good one, okay. Uh, what's another one? Okay, those that are in bonds, that's an interesting one for, for us today. Uh, I, I put it down this way, uh, remembering those who are persecuted for doing the right things. Okay, so... In this particular case, they're talking about prison, people in prison, visiting people in prison. But uh, today, at least right now, as we live, and this may change in the, in the near future, but right now, the, the persecutions that are, are hitting us are not of this nature.
but they're every bit as tough on a person. You know, sometimes it's just all you can bear, especially our kids in uh, college, in, in, in school, in public school. Uh, there's a lot of challenges in there, and so we need to remember them and think about them. Question two, what can be learned from Abraham entertaining angels, though at the time he was unaware? What is it about hospitality that, that uh, is, is a lesson here from the Abraham example? Todd? You never know when you are doing this thing for God. Like Jesus said, when you do it to the least of these, you do it unto me. You, you never know what the outcome of a simple act of kindness will be on somebody else's life, do you? I mean, they may tell you years, years from, from now, you remember when we sat in the parking lot that one night and, and uh, you, gave, you, know, you told me this and everything? You don't know what I was going through that night. If it hadn't been for you, I was, good, I was ready to go out and just end it. Just, and if you hadn't done that, I, I don't know how many stories. I mean, there's thousands of stories like that. You may have one in your own personal life. Uh, Norm has one in his own personal life about him and Ross Spears out in the parking lot at Roswell down in Georgia. And it was a turning point, a complete turning point. And so uh, never underestimate uh, you know, that part of hospitality and doing something for, for somebody else. Um, hospitality comes from an honest desire to make someone else comfortable and building friendships and relationships. Uh, and this is the key. Always be ready for the opportunity to share. Because the opportunities will, will come if you are the type of person who is open to the opportunity. God will use you because uh, he, he always knows the right thing to do. Question three, how is, does remembering those in prison relate to the context here? You, it's a, you yourselves are also in the body. I was going to have you read 1 Corinthians 12, verses 20 through 27 about the one body, but uh, what, what is it saying about, remember those in prison, remember those who are suffering? Why, why would that be a good thing? <laughs> right. For them, right? So it would be a good thing for them. But how about you? What do you get out of it? Think about this one. <laughs> I mean, all of us are going to go through highs and lows in our life. And is it, is it okay to be a little selfish once in a while and just think about the idea that helping somebody else might just be something that would be, not, not for what I can get out of it right now, but I'm building a relationship so because I know that there's going to be times where I'm going to need people to help me. I really am. And if I've never helped anybody in my life, what is the motivation out there for them to help me. I mean, be a little selfish every once in a while, just in bringing that, that, to, that idea to mind, in that uh, there's, there's a reason, there's, there's two sides to doing the right thing all the time. It's okay to do the right thing because you wanna do it. I mean, that's, as a matter of fact, that's what you're supposed to do, it's a positive thing. Okay, uh, we have time for one more. What does verse 4 teach us about the sexual relationship? Verse 4 is talking about the marriage and the marriage bed. Okay, the, these three things are associated with that. Marriage is to be held in honor. It's only a, a, the only appropriate place for sexual activity, and then God will judge those who violate the laws. Okay, that's all we have time for. Uh, you guys have been great. Uh, I've, I've enjoyed the study. Uh, I hope you guys got something out of it uh, too. And good job. <laughs>